So it's pretty amazing. We've got, uh, and, and thank you again, Admiral. We'll be able to take questions of him and Eric and a few. But, uh, cool, you know, we've got the President's Arctic strategy out, uh, the implementation plan for the National Ocean Policy that many of us have been working on and will be working on again tomorrow to educate our elected officials. Uh, and we all know that one of the missing elements is real public engagement. We talked about it last night, how we engage the public in terms of our artist panel. And there's a, a gray whale from Plastic Waste that Claudia Garcon made. And we'll, uh, we'll do an auction with uh, artwork this fall. Art's one way, exploration's another. We got a lot of notice uh, when James Cameron went back down where our eventually award winner Don Walsh had been 60 years ago, the deepest point in the ocean. Um, but exploration doesn't require that you, you know, invest billions in uh, high technology. We've now got a whole generation of submersibles, including manned and, and woman submersibles. So uh, I'd like to introduce Erica. Um, Erica Bergman's 25-year-old ocean advocate and a licensed uh, a submersible pilot, and talk about uh, how we reach out to both to this and the next generation. Starship Enterprise. 
And one of the uh, most influential, influential moments in my life was watching a Star Trek movie where somehow space meets the ocean and there are whales in trouble in space and uh, the, the captain has to get aboard this tall ship and go save whales. And I found that tall ship. That's what got me on board the Lady Washington. And I sailed along some of the most stunning western coastlines that you could possibly imagine. And while I spent much of that time below decks, elbow deep in fairing casings and engine grease, it um, really gave me the understanding that the ocean is the biggest, most badass kid on the block, and I wanted to be part of that game. Oceanography turned out to be my ticket in. I went to the University of Washington, and I studied chemical oceanography. And one of the most exciting and interesting things that I figured out right away was that I could share my sea stories with someone to whom the ocean was something of a foreign environment. Um, and they would begin to understand and have concepts of what the ocean means in their daily lives, even if they never even been to a beach. There are so many people and a lot of young people who are, live on the coastlines, very close to the ocean, and never get a chance to go see it. So they don't know what they're missing. But if you can go into a classroom and start talking to people about what the ocean looks like and encourage them to get out there and encourage their parents to take them there, that's what's going to bring these new innovators and these new explorers out into the world of oceanography. Uh, about that time that I came to the realization that storytelling was such a powerful tool, uh, I went straight into pilot training with Ocean Gate. I graduated from college, and a week later, I was on board Antipodes uh, for the uh, certain kind of mechanical survey called Special Survey, where you just rip the whole thing apart, and you put it back together piece by piece. And this time, it did actually come back together. I didn't just leave the pieces lying around. Uh, but the sub came, uh, became to me a set of tools, unlike any I'd ever had before, to share sea stories. The sub became what I like to think of as a universal translator. Direct observation enhances exploration because of putting brains in the sea and the maps and the sounds and the feelings and you can perceive acceleration, all kinds of things that an ROV can't translate to us. But a sub gives you the ability to simulate that environment for an audience through the stories you tell at the deep. Audible clues let us know what marine life surrounds us. Um, in diving in Monterey, California, a couple of years ago, a massive pod of dozens and dozens of common dolphins appeared out of nowhere, just sort of out of the distance, and they were chasing a ball of sardines. And they were so loud on the underwater scuba foam and echoing through the inch and a half steel hull that we couldn't even communicate with our surface support vessel. So this is a little bit loud, but I'm going to cue up the first clip and you'll hear a little bit about what it sounds like. They were, yeah, they made communication that day very difficult, but they were really excited to eat those sardines. A year later, and about 3,000 miles away, I was on the Atlantic coast diving in Miami and I happen to have that recording on my handy dandy iPhone, which we all carry around these days. And just out of curiosity and for a fluke, I sort of held my iPhone up to the scuba phone and I transmitted that same signal out into the water column, out into the bay. And again, out of nowhere, I had no idea they were nearby, another type of dolphin, bottlenose dolphins, came racing into the sub at lightning speed. And uh, I, I captured a, a little bit of them too, so here's one more short clip. I'm not a marine biologist, so I don't know exactly what they were saying there, but I'd imagine that a whole bunch of dolphins excitedly eating sardines roughly translates to the uh, bottlenose dolphins, something along the lines of, oh boy, food. Dolphins are one of the things that most make the most incredible photos underwater. They are great role model, uh, 
models that pose for the camera. There are a number of other creatures that pose um, for us quite well at the same time. You can roll this one for a second. Uh, and it often makes me feel less like the observer and more like I'm being observed in my deep sea terrarium. Here, here are some of the encounters that we have. There's a green sea turtle in Miami that came and swam right underneath the sub. These inquisitive guys came up and tapped the sub. They'll come up with their face and actually touch you. And, uh, the beautiful sea nettles in Monterey, California. My background in enthusiasm, however, are in chemistry and physics. And chemistry and physics don't tend to pose well for photos. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> Instead, I have to use my stories and my other senses to bring chemistry and physics to life for the classrooms and the students that I go and talk to. So imagine, if you will, the coastline and the east horizon stretching off into the Atlantic. The, the, uh, the Gulf Stream runs usually between four and five miles offshore, and there's very little evidence of it at the surface, usually a sort of change in roughness where the velocity of the stream uh, heading north sort of smooths out what might be rougher water in a stiller area. And there's usually a, a small border of sargasso seaweed that lines the Gulf Stream. But dive below the surface, and what's only hinted at above water, subsurface rises up above you like a mural painted in this sort of Caribbean camouflage. The water alternates between teal and aquamarine and all of these opalescent shades, and it radiates up in front of you like heat radiating off of a hot tarmac. That's something I never would have imagined. This is neither a unique nor a first discovery, but I find that it's the kind of story that makes somewhat abstract concepts in oceanography more tangible. What is the Gulf Stream? Oh, it moves fast. But what does it look like? Heat radiating off of a tarmac. Um, another one of my favorites that brings science into a realm that a number of land lovers or non-oceanographers can understand um, is the, is the concept of data that we collect underwater. So there's this device called a CTD. That stands for Conductivity, Temperature, and Density. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. But for those who aren't, it's basically like taking the heart rate and the blood pressure of the ocean. Vital statistics, as it were. And I can put up a graph, and I can spend three or four minutes explaining the axes and how this set of lines and numbers indicates that there's a layer of fresh water sitting on top of a saltwater body. Or I can tell the story of how we were diving in the Puget Sound in Washington. It had been heavily raining all weekend, and um, I was venting air from the ballast tank to submerge until we were submerging at about our standard rate, which is somewhere around two feet per second. You know, not too fast. It's like an elevator. And moments into the dive, completely taking me by surprise, the sub decelerated rapidly, almost to a halt. And I realized what had happened was we were sitting right on the interface where that fresh water meets the salt water. The sub was heavy enough to sink through fresh water, but light enough to sit on top of the salt water. And it felt like diving into a swimming pool full of pudding. <laughs> it was incredible. And that's what exploration has come to mean to me physical evidence that science rules. <laughs> but what is the point of all of these stories if they just sort of sit in the recesses of your mind? The whole purpose of having these experiences is to share them. And outreach paves the way for, uh, to increase understanding of the ocean and encourage people to protect and consider it. The oceans have sustained us for so many centuries. It's our turn to help the oceans. And I have the great pleasure of doing that right now through a small new organization called Explore Ocean. And we try to make exploration a personal experience for anyone that we come in contact with. Mostly students, we're trying to hit the age range 16, 17, 18. Um, by going into classes, mostly the STEM classes, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, also STEAM, which adds art onto that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
And we bring students out with us in the field. We brought them out to explore the shipwreck Hatteras with a bunch of technical divers. We have brought them out on the Art Rydell Jr. shipwreck, um, which was a, a day of submersible diving. The students all came on board and were able to participate with the pilots um, on field expedition. But they're not just observers, they're working parts of the exploration team. They have a job to do. And, and that's what's so powerful about exploration. It becomes their own experience. Between field expeditions, um, because we obviously can't get every student out on a boat, we try to bring exploration to them in an, in an interactive way as possible by bringing submarines to them. How cool is that? So here's uh, what one of our submarines looks like in action. This is a little two-man submarine that we brought to the Mate ROV competition. And these students were able to get inside the submarine and, uh, thank you, and um, learn the differences between piloting an ROV and piloting a submarine, and getting an idea and a scope for what ocean exploration could look, look like for them. And that there are so many options open to them. A student at that age can do anything they want. You can be a lawyer, you can be a, a, a scientist, you can be a technician, you can be a mechanic, you can do anything you want, but we're just encouraging them to consider doing it on the ocean. We also um, have done some neat things with college, the CSUMB in Monterey, uh, that's California State University in Monterey Bay, built a number of marine robotic components that mimic real life uh, versions. They designed their own manipulator, they designed their own Niskin bottle, they designed their own infrared sensors. And we put them on the submarine and we put one of the students on board who had made the, you know, the most exciting device and we took them down to 900 feet and we tested them to see how they worked. And that's the kind of hands-on experience that makes submarines so exciting. Um, Oh, there are uh, a number of students here who are actually already on that road. And I'd love to give a shout out. I know there are students here from the Harbor School who are already training to be captains and pilots and technicians and scientists. And there's also that huge Colorado constituent. I know I've heard you guys yelling a bunch of times and Teens for Oceans. Uh, and I'm so impressed with the work that you've done because they're out engaging with the oceans <laughs> and educating the kids. I had so much to learn from these students. My initial goal with exploration was to go into classrooms and inspire students, but what I found was that they actually began to inspire me. And in the light of all of the challenges that our oceans face and the number of problems, I think one of the key things that I learned by going into classrooms is to keep a sense of lightness and not take ourselves too seriously because the ocean brings us joy. And on that note, I'd like to finish with uh, this informative little tidbit. And uh, thank you very much. How old did you just say? 